is Métis? Tonight on Nation to Nation. The Métis Nation of Ontario has been accused of whitewashing its communities, all because of who it accepts as Métis. These are not new communities, they're very old communities. It's the Métis National Council that wants Ontario out, but does everyone agree? The Ambenos definition, I believe, is exactly the same definition that we use in our provinces. Meanwhile, no one argues that Alberta's Métis settlements aren't Métis. But there, it's all about getting more federal recognition. And what we're trying to do is, because of the Daniels case, move into our Section 35 rights and have those rights honoured and recognised by the federal government. Hello, I'm Todd Lamran and welcome to Nation to Nation. Three Métis nations, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario, were in the capital region this week to talk about how to go forward on a self-governing deal signed last June. But at the same time, the Manitoba Métis Federation was hosting a citizenship forum in Saskatoon. It exposes a deep division among the organizations that make up the Métis National Council. And it centers around Ontario's acceptance of citizens the MMF says are outside the Métis homeland. And join me now are the three presidents. To my immediate right is President Margaret Fro of the Métis Nation of Ontario. President Glenn McCallum from the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan and President Audrey Poitra from the Métis Nation of Alberta. Thank you for being on Nation to Nation. Thank you for having us. Uh, now President Fro, I guess I'll start with you. I know um, you talked about uh, moving forward as a self-governing trio. Uh, there's a bit of a dark cloud hanging over everything at the same time that you're here. There's a, an event in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon. So how can we move forward when there's this kind of dark cloud over everything? Well, actually, if you would have been with us for the last two days, you wouldn't have seen any dark clouds at all. It was quite extraordinary. We had two days of about 250 Métis leaders, citizens. Uh, we had First Nation advisors, negotiators. We had uh, a lot of government people come to talk about Métis self-government. It was actually two incredibly positive, forward-looking days. And, and that's very much what we focused on for our event was the work that we are doing in each of our respective governments um, to move our governments forward under that under that dream, that vision of self self-government, self-determination, recognizing that there is another event that's happening. Um, but ours ours was absolutely uh, one hundred percent positive and and again very forward looking, very respectful, uh, and very much focused on moving forward for our people. Uh, President McCallum, I think you've said in the past that you feel there is no tension between Métis Nation of Saskatchewan and Métis National Council. I mean, but uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric coming out of Manitoba. Uh, how can you, I suppose, say that? It depends where you're looking from, I, I believe. You know, a lot of people in, our, in Canada don't realize in regards to the struggles that we've had, but more importantly, the structures that we've been working on. As you well know, in Saskatchewan, we have a constitution. We have an Elections Act. We just had an uh, election, and uh, we have our president, local president, voted in. We have our regional directors that make up our provincial Métis Council, and we have our Legislative Assembly, where is our ultimate governing structure. So for somebody to say there's things going on, I don't see it. I've seen it previously in regards to the lack of uh, us being involved in the last 15, 20 years, but as far as where I'm concern, concerned, where I'm looking from, everything's okay. So again, you get to judge and be able to ask the, the right questions in regards to my our situation in Saskatchewan, everything's been followed, we have a system in place, everything's okay. We've been engaging with our people with the resources that we've been given by the federal government, uh, specifically uh, education, housing. Uh, we rolled out our program last year and uh, we rolled out the program, 475 students applied for post-secondary. There's now 374 going to school. We have first-time home buyers program that we have. So we're doing a lot of stuff in Saskatchewan. We now are going through uh, engagements with our people as far as uh, constitutional reform, judicial tribunal process going on. So uh, health and uh, education, uh, environment, we, actually, uh, uh, we have a uh, harvesting MOU that we're working on with the province. So there's a lot of things going on. But if you look at the national level in regards to a lot of people saying that uh, things are, there's a dark cloud. No, there isn't. 
if you look at a, demo a democracy in any organization, us as governments look at uh, Métis National Council as a lobbying group. So if you look at it from a perspective where how did it exist, it's because it has bylaws that they have to, uh, they have, we have to follow. And in order to follow bylaws, you have to have meetings. And there's five of us that are the, are the Board of Governors, uh, six with uh, the, the women uh, representatives that sits at the table. And so if you don't call the meeting, which is uh, the president's responsibility to be able to call a meeting, then uh, the cloud is not on us. It's on them because they're not following the rules in regards to how things will, uh, should be handled. Uh, president Poitra, uh, uh, President McCallum said there's no dark cloud, but again, uh, this is kind of concerning to a lot of Métis. Uh, and in your province, we had six communities form their own Métis Federation of Alberta. Uh, so, I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, yes, there's been a, there's been some dissension in our northern communities, and um, it is um, um, MNC is partly behind that. Um, President Charche and um, th those communities are, um, I believe, there's a president of one of those communities who ran against me in the election, didn't win, decided he wanted nothing more to do with the, with the Métis Nation of Alberta, and has created his own body, and has enticed a few people to come along with him. I would not say seven communities, I would maybe say seven leaders from locals, but we all know locals are more than one person, or two persons, or three persons. Um, a couple of those communities have already called us to come out and have some discussions. Um, which were supposed to be part of that group. So um, it's, there's always challenges in everything we do, but for us, we look forward uh, to, to the, this very meeting that we had uh, yesterday and today, because in the uh, Métis Nation of Alberta, we have waited 90 plus years mm -hmm. to get to this spot, and our people are excited about it. We just had a youth and seniors conference um, uh, two weeks ago, with 450 people there who were totally excited about the new approach to where we're going with, with the Constitution and all of that that we need to do to, to firm up our Métis government within Alberta. Uh, back to you, President Fro. Um, I guess for you, is the Métis National Council dead for you since you've been kicked out uh, because of perceived, uh, that you've included six communities that uh, Mr. Chartrand, President Chartrand says aren't Métis? Yeah, well, from our perspective, we're not kicked out at all. The The decision of the Assembly in November of 2018 was to put the MNO on probation. And it, it, it set out a list of conditions, and at the end of the year, if we weren't able to complete those conditions, the resolution was extremely clear. It said the matter will come back to the General Assembly for further discussion and determining what the next steps are. Uh, that never happened, and in fact, there's been opportunities to hold assemblies to do just that. And in fact, I, from from the night before that resolution was passed, I spoke to the board of governors and I spoke at the assembly as well during the the discussion around that resolution to say, we actually want to have a discussion around this, but it needs to be a discussion that's based on fact, and based on principles, and and we want that, we welcome that. In fact, we've been ever since that resolution was passed. We have been asking for Board of Governors meetings to be able to actually talk with the Board of Governors and uh, about exactly what it is that we've done in Ontario, all the research that went into the, um, the joint uh, between the MNO and the province of Ontario, the joint announcement of the recognition of, these are not new communities, they're very old communities, but the recognition of these communities. So, so you're, you're confident that these are Métis communities that could pass a PALI test, for example? Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, the Pali community itself is one of the communities that President Chartrand, Chartrand is now saying. In spite of being behind it and supporting it, in spite of the MNC, in fact, making arguments before the Supreme Court of, Cal of Canada clearly saying this Sault Ste. Marie community is part of the Métis Nation, in spite of all of that, there is a bit of revisionist history now that's happening to say that it's, that it's not. From where we're standing, we, we had the Supreme Court victory in Pali that all Métis governments, including the Métis National Council, as the, the, the Métis National Council, to be clear, is the sum of its parts. It is the five governing members coming together along with our women. That is the Métis National Council. It supported the MNO in Pali. It celebrated the Pali decision. And following that, we went through a process under our harvesting agreement with the province where we agreed we would work together cooperatively 
to assess the historic record, to apply the, the legal test set out by the Supreme Court of Canada to determine where in Ontario is there a history of distinct Métis communities. That, that is, the result of that was the announcement around the seven historic communities, including the Pali community. Uh, Presidents McCallum and Poitra, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. How comfortable, are you comfortable with the MNO's definition of Métis? I'll start with you, President McCallum. Yes, I am. Uh, the principles that we have in regards to how we do things and the guidelines that we follow and the rules that we follow are, are things that we have to respect and understand. And I'd feel the same way if somebody was to come into our province and try dictating to us in regards to what should be happening. We have to have that respect and have provinces work with their, with their uh, system in regards to how they move forward. As a matter of fact, uh, when we had our Edmonton meeting, Margaret and uh, I didn't realize that they've hired an independent firm to be able to do their, uh, their citizenship and they did a, a real good presentation and uh, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan and our councils got to listen and really appreciated the hard work that they've been doing in coming up with a system in regards to what is fair for everyone. Uh, P President Poitra, again, are you comfortable with the MNO's uh, definition of Métis? The MNO's definition, I believe, is exactly the same definition that we use in our provinces. Um, we had a process of that at Métis National Council. Once that definition was brought forward, we all had to take it back and get it installed within our governing documents, which I know we all did. Um, and again, as, as Glenn has said, uh, in January when we had our meetings, um, President Fro brought out uh, her genealogists, her historians, the people who did the work for them. And for me, I would like to have that meeting with MNC to see what the concerns are because we had a very clear picture of how they do their, their registry, basically following the definition. So if there's something else missing, I'm not aware of it and I'd like to know that. Uh, of course, the uh, MNC meeting is supposed to be scheduled for the end of April. I mean, if it does go through, are you going to attend it? Um, we will be talking about that um, at, at the Métis Nation within Alberta. We will be talking about that because it wasn't called properly. Um, the, there is a clear process in the MNC bylaws as to how a meeting and an election gets called. We haven't had a Board of Governors, so that couldn't have been called properly. Uh, but certainly we need to, we know we want to get to a meeting, so that's one of the things that uh, my council wants to talk about. We were focusing on this self-government conference, but we will be talking about that very soon. Uh, President McCallum, uh, again, um, will you be attending an MNC meeting if one is called for the end of April? You know, it's just like sitting in the studio and you have your board of directors and you have rules to follow. If you were asked to go to a meeting without the proper chairperson calling the meeting for uh, people to come together, would you go? There's rules everywhere that, you, that, that organizations are formed and we have rules with the Métis National Council, Council which is a lobbying group for us and it has rules and it has bylaws and those are the things that we have to follow. Until the president calls a meeting and then we can answer you, uh, I can answer that question, am I going to go? But again, it has to go to all the five governing bodies in regards to addressing issues that we have in front of us. Uh, President Fro, uh, I mean, how do you respond when uh, President Chartrand puts out uh, that uh, he's protecting the Métis Nation from a third invasion, for example? Yeah, it's, um, I was asked that question, and in fact, the quote was put to me. I understand President Chartrand made the statement, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of non-Indigenous people will be allowed into the Métis Nation. And, and I responded at the time, and I respond again now, that's completely absurd. We have a registry of 22,000 citizens right now in Ontario. We know that that will grow. We know that it's absolutely um, not the full uh, community in Ontario. However, uh, we are nowhere near hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And in fact, everything that we do within the Métis Nation of Ontario is based on uh, a very stringent test. We, ha we apply the national definition. There has been a shifting target in terms of what are the boundaries. Uh, and so that, the, that there was a decision uh, made with regard to a map in November of 2018 that dramatically changed those boundaries. But um, for the, uh, since we adopted the, resolu the national definition in 2004, we have been applying that. And in fact, every, every decision that we make in terms of granting citizenship in terms of making any types of assertions of Métis rights is based on 
facts. And we have always said, and we continue to say, that our, that our cause, our, our claim for Métis rights will rise or fall on the facts of history. We're not making stuff up. We are making decisions based on fact. Well, gee, I, I wish I could go on and on with you. Uh, it's such an important discussion, especially for me. Um, but um, fortunately, we'll have to wait for another time. So thank you for coming and speaking to me now. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. After the break, I talk to a different type of Prairie Métis leader, one who has nothing to do with the Métis National Council. Welcome back. In northern Alberta, Métis have a land base. There are eight settlements populated by about 6,500 people. They are not part of the Métis Nation of Alberta and therefore not a part of the Métis National Council. Poor says socioeconomic conditions on the settlements mirror some First Nations reserves. A couple of years ago, they signed a framework agreement with Ottawa to better cement a relationship with the federal government. To talk more about it all, I'm joined by the president of the Métis Settlements General Council, Herb Lair. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you very much, Todd. Really appreciate the chance to update people through APTN. Now, uh, as I mentioned in my intro, uh, there was a framework signed a couple of years ago. Uh, so is your goal to be kind of a self-governing entity, kind of like what uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario did when they signed uh, an agreement last June? Well, going back to 1990, we already are a self-governing, but our governance right now is through the provincial government, so under Section 92. And what we're trying to do is, because of the Daniels case, move into our Section 35 rights and have those rights honoured and recognised by the federal government. That's I think I've heard it called that your relationship with the province of Alberta, they were like a stepdad, and now it's time to move on uh, to Ottawa. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, what benefit would that have then if uh, you're dealing just with Ottawa rather than Edmonton? Well, we wouldn't be looking at just dealing with the federal government alone. We, we believe in concurrent legislation that the province, uh, as taxpaying Albertans, that we, you know, we're owed a, a responsibility back to us from the provincial government, but as well as Section 35 right holders that would open a whole new door for us. So, you know, again, that's something that we have to determine ourselves what those rights would encompass because it's not up to any federal government or provincial government to tell us what our Indigenous rights are. But some of those rights could include things like the same as First Nations and Inuit when it comes to education, it comes to health, uh, things such as taxation exempt while you're on your community. So types of things like that. But again, just more control over everything. And you know, we're encouraged by things like Bill C-92, where you see the devolution down to the communities and to Indigenous people to take care of their own children, to, to actually take in and put some of our rights forward. Uh, now, why are the settlements not a part of the Métis Nation of Alberta? Well, there, there are a couple of, uh, of major reasons. And one of them, the, the basic reason is that the Métis Nation of Alberta, the Métis National Council, all of the rest of the affiliates, affiliates to the Métis National Council don't have a land base. So they don't negotiate with the federal government for infrastructure needs. So, you know, in our communities, we're responsible for the water treatment plants, the, the uh, sewer, the, the natural gas, the power, the, you know, the development of roads, the maintenance of roads, all these types of things that the other Métis aren't responsible for. So if they're not negotiating for that, then how is it that they can even really take care of the needs of our communities? I suppose, do you watch what's going on currently with all the organizations and the uh, current rift among them? I don't know, say to yourself that maybe we are better on our own? Well, you know, I look at it and, uh, you know, I, I contemplate uh, all of this talk about reconciliation and, and perhaps we need to recognize that the uh, federal and provincial governments have for years tried to ensure that as Indigenous people that we weren't working together, that, uh, that we were always fighting amongst each other and causing a rift amongst us. 
And perhaps reconciliation should begin with allowing us to reconcile between our, ourselves. Now, I know non-settlement Métis communities in northern Alberta have broken away and formed an Alberta Métis Federation. Any chances of you and them joining forces? That is something that we'd have to contemplate with our, our 40 elected officials from, we have five from each of the eight settlements and that would be the direction that they would have to decide on. I do know that historically when we uh, go back in time, we do know that the Métis Nation of Alberta did try to go after the resources underneath the lands of the, the Métis settlements and that was part of the reason for the rift amongst us and that uh, that was under Charlottetown and you know so we have to ensure that first of all that we're able to take care of those members on the settlement with the resources that we have and they're very limited resources right now and for example the the province gives us uh, under the long-term agreement five million dollars a year and that five million dollars a year is, is supposed to take care of all of the needs of all of the Métis that are residing on the settlements. And if you can imagine trying to run eight different communities and a central governance with five million dollars, recognizing that 4.7 million of that is pre-spent. So uh, we've 2.4 of it is set aside to deal with infrastructure needs. 1.3 million of that is used so that we can provide a police officer in every one of the eight settlements. So w by the time we take care of all of the things that are committed, there's $300,000 left over to spread between the settlements for, for everything else, for their governance components and their administration. And tell me anybody else who can run those communities, any community for $300,000 when you, you have to grade the roads, take care of, you know, even the problems that, that are coming up with the coronavirus so that you have to educate people and you have to be prepared so that if something ever happened in your communities that you could deal with those issues. It sounds like uh, then um, would it be better than to, to deal directly with the federal government, with the province, rather than go through uh, another organization. It sounds like you, what you're saying is you're, you're better on your own right now. Well, right now, that's that's typically what uh, the majority of us believe is that that we're quite well prepared to deal with everything on our own. We we have five elected officials in the communities that communicate with their membership, that then come up to Métis Settlements General Council and bring their collective concerns forward, so that from the eight we can look at what do we need to do both federally and provincially, and then we'll go advocate with those different ministers and premiers and prime ministers if they give us an opportunity to. Okay, uh, President Lair, I want to thank you for speaking to me. Thank you very much, Todd. Really appreciate the chance to educate more people. We'll have more after a short break. Well, I just have time to say I hope everyone is safe and is taking the proper precautions during this time of concern over the COVID-19 pandemic, such as washing hands frequently and avoiding unnecessary travel. I'm Todd Lamoran. Thanks for watching.